Good afternoon. My name is Kent Morgan, and I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as Dr. Cog TAC. I call to order the October 25th, 2021 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. Dr. Cog uses the digital platform Zoom. Members and alternates, you have the ability to mute and unmute yourselves and share your webcam. We ask that you use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak for an agenda item. Please make sure that you, your type name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask questions related to the agenda item. At this time, Cam, uh, would you uh, please uh, do roll call? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, uh, in attendance at this moment, I currently see Kent Mormon, Art Griffith, Bill Soroy, Brooke Svoboda, Carol Buchanan, Christopher Montoya, Danny Herman, Elizabeth Relford, Eugene Howard, George Holokoff, Jessica Furco, Kristen Kenyon, Mac Callison, uh, Maria DeAndre, Paul Gisaitis, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, and Steve Durian. Those are the members I currently see at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. If you did not hear your name, uh, please uh, email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added to the record. Um, I would also like to introduce a new TAC member, uh, Wally Wirt. Um, Wally is filling the vacant freight specialist interest position and uh, welcome aboard Wally. We will now move on to uh, the meeting summary and um, oh, first we'll do public comment, I'm sorry, public comment. We will now open the meeting uh, for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you uh, by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which time uh, we will ask you to wrap up and your uh, line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. With that, um, see if anyone has raised their hand. I am not seeing any. Uh, Jacob, are you seeing any on your end? Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, no, I'm not. Okay, uh, keeping you on your feet today, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to find All that right. button. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, we'll um, move on then and close public comment. Um, the uh, October sixth uh, TAC meeting uh, summary was sent out uh, for your review. Is there any discussion, uh, corrections, or questions about the, about the uh, TAC sum meeting summary? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing none, um, um, the minutes stand approved, and we'll move on to the next item. We have no action items today. Um, so we'll move right on into our informational briefings. It'll be on the 2024-2027 draft tip policy um, discussion, and Todd will lead this. This is the actual uh, um, tip policy that was in your uh, draft tip policy that was in your packet. So, um, Todd, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a somewhat brief presentation here um, for you this afternoon. And uh, then I'll be simply be turning it over to you to ask questions that you may have regarding the draft document that is included within your packet. So I will go ahead and get started uh, so we can have a discussion later on. So just wanted to start with sort of uh, an overall 
uh, review of the document itself. Um, as a quick overview, there is it is a tra and track changes included within your packet. Um, the track changes excludes things such as wordsmithing, um, changing from the 2023 tip to the 2427 tip. Um, we've also put in notations where there may be possible locations to add new text if there is a new transportation bill, which um, from everything I've been hearing may come at the end of this week, we'll see. Um, in addition to um, any greenhouse gas uh, integration that may, may need to be included within the, in the policy. Um, so we will hold all of that. And if there is progress made in those areas, we certainly will include that in your next meeting. Um, if not in your next meeting, certainly included within the, the draft document that we'll be asking you to take action on uh, in December. So go ahead and get started with some of the higher level uh, document edits. So contained within the first chapter, which is the introduction, um, the main element here really is that the tip schedule has not been updated at this time, and we will simply update that um, hopefully for your next meeting. Um, so if you recall at your last meeting, there was a discussion regarding the multimodal options fund and the two options um, staff presented to move forward on how to program not only the current tip, but also the 24 to 27 tip. So um, our board uh, will be having that discussion at their November 3rd board work session. So of course, we'll include information at that time or after that time, I should say. Uh, chapter two outlines the roles and requirements that are required to receive a project. Um, so the first uh, regarding the agency roles, uh, and this mainly has to do with the funding sources. And of course, that really relies on a if and when and if a new federal infrastructure bill does pass. So of course, that will be updated at a, at a later time. Um, the next section within this chapter deals with the capital project el eligibility and simply says that um, if you have a project in the current RTP in that 20 to 29 staging period, um, you would be eligible to submit any project phase, so um, pre-construction and construction. However, if that project is listed within the 30 to 39 staging period, you would be eligible for the project development portions of that project, i.e. anything except for construction. Uh, for those projects that contain a technology component, um, we have cleaned up and expanded that language related to the regional operations plan and systems engineering analysis. So again, just beefed up that language a little bit. Um, regarding the freight section, we've also added language related to the economy, um, reliability, and emissions. Chapter three deals with the initial programming steps that Dr. Cog takes before the calls for projects are issued. Um, so looking at that section, um, one of them was the funding assessment, uh, essentially just cleaned up this language regarding the funding sources um, for the set-aside programs. Um, the set-asides have been updated um, based on our previous discussions at TAC. Um, within that section also contains other commitments that Dr. Cog makes. So within the previous tip, there was a central 70 and a fast track commitment. Um, those both have been removed. Regarding the central 70 commitments, um, our board had made a commitment over two tip cycles. Um, the second tip cycle was that 20 to 23. So that commitment no longer um, is included within the policy. Um, regarding the fast tracks commitments, um, for those who have been around a while, our board made that commitment back in 2008. Um, there's two remaining corridors that have not received their allotment of funds, um, which is the Central Corridor and the Southwest Corridor. Uh, staff has been in discussions with, with those corridor partners and hopes to program that sometime um, within the next six months to a year so that that commitment does not necessarily have to carry over into the 24 to 27 tip period. So chapter four deals with the regional and the sub-regional calls for projects. Um, so first, just a couple overview um, topics that have adjusted. We have replaced the focus areas um, with those uh, 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan project and program investment priorities, as we have previously discussed. Um, also within the financial requirements, we have clarified the multimodal fund match language. 
So moving into the regional share, um, we have updated the intent of what the regional share funds are, which links it to the regional uh, MetroVision objectives and outcomes. Within the funding portion of the regional share, um, we have replaced the language and said that it so there, the submittals that you make must be no less than $100,000, but no more than $20 million. We've also replaced the 50% the match minimum with a 20% match min minimum as previously discussed. Uh, we have also updated the project and program eligibility requirements, again, based on previous discussion. Uh, we've also noted that there, there will be the parallel track applications um, one being with the surface transportation block grant and the second on an air quality multimodal um, track. For the sub-regional share, um, very similar in a lot of aspects to the regional share. Um, we've updated the funding targets um, with the current uh, data. Um, we've updated the project and program eligibility requirements. Um, so this section perhaps looks a little different visually than it did in the past. Um, we've actually included a very similar style table as with the regional share. However, it does still contain that very similar open eligibility as with the last tip cycle. Uh, and again, we've uh, very similar to regional share. We've added language um, regarding the parallel track applications. Um, and the last thing with this section is that uh, we've changed the language of the, which in the application submittal process um, to note that the applications in the subregional share process will come to Dr. Cog first instead of the subregions in order that we can check for eligibility, post them on the website, um, update the scoring sheets, and then hand those back to the subregions again in hopes to kind of take a little bit of pressure off of the subregional. Um, forums to to do that process ahead of actually looking at the applications. Uh, chapter five deals with the TIP development. So essentially what happens after the calls for projects have taken place, what happens when um, the document has been updated and what happens um, to modify that document. So within the amendments and the modifications, again, just relatively minor language changes to refine and clarify the criteria and what triggers um, that take place for a TIP amendment or for a TIP modification. Uh, we've also added language to explain what happens if there happens to be a funding increase. Um, for those who remember this is sort of what has happened within the last year um, in that we would seek Dr. Cog board approval to issue a new call for projects if that happens to be necessary. Uh, and finally, within Appendix A, which contains um, the selection processes for RTD and CDOT, for the RTD process, we've uh, re made reference to their midterm financial plan, and within the CDOT process, made reference to the 10-year plan and then other uh, program changes that uh, they had requested we make. So um, I think that's all that I had to go through for today. Um, like I said in the beginning, this topic is really um, up for the members to discuss, um, bring additional topics for us for discussion, or if there happens to be any slight language changes, we can certainly note those and bring that back to your last meeting. So I have the policy here that I will bring up and uh, I guess turn it over to you, Mr. Chair, and, and see if there's discussion items. Okay, is there any uh, questions or discussion? Please raise your hand. And let's go chapter by chapter with the introduction and then into the chapter one for the first group. Any questions on that or comments? Please raise your hand. I see none. So let's move on to, oh, Alex raised his hand. Go ahead, Alex. You're muted, Alex. Go ahead. Sorry, I um, I have a question, but I was, I was struggling to figure out which chapter it was in before we moved on. Um, oh. My question related to page 31 of the PDF. I was trying to figure out where chapter structure that was. Uh, that is near, that is chapter four or five, I believe. Alrighty, then I will hold my question till then. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Alex. 
Any others want to comment on the introduction or chapter one? Nope. Well, about chapter two. Phil, go ahead. I just had a question at the bottom of paper page five, I guess, or listed page five. We talked about the um, eligible projects, eligible activities, and you list three bullets there. And then in the next piece, it says, this section only deals with capital projects. So this is the top of page six. And it basically talks about anything less than one mile in length remain eligible as if the other ones were ineligible. So I'm just wondering if that's just a wordsmith kind of change that we need to make or, um, and maybe I can just work with you offline on that one, but it was just one question I had about kind of okay. the wording as far as what's eligible and what's not. Gotcha. I, I think the main concept of what we were trying to do in this section is to state exactly what is eligible in terms of a capital project. And then in this, we were trying to re, um, just remind folks that this section only deals with the capital projects. And if it happens to be an operational type project, it would still be oh. eligible. Okay, gotcha, thank you. But yes, we'll, we'll double check the language to make sure that's exactly what we're stating. Appreciate yeah. it, thank you. Yeah, I, I read the same thing, Phil, and had to read it two or three times. So Todd, if you guys could cl clarify that, that, that paragraph a little, it'd be appreciated. Okay, perfect. Any other questions on chapter two? Please raise your hand. I see no hands raised, so let's move on to chapter three. Any questions on chapter three? I see no hands raised, so let's move on to chapter four. And I know Alex had a question on that. So Alex, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, my first question, I think, was on page 31 of our packet. Um, it was, um, let's see, this pertains to the regional uh, eligibility for projects, and it was related to the studies. Um, so for studies, the study limits must include the entire MPO boundary at a minimum and specifically address one of the following categories listed above. Um, I guess I'm struggling with how a study would have to address the entire MPO boundary and kind of want to ask my question through the lens of um, a study that we submitted in the previous tip, um, which was waitlisted and subsequently re received funding, but the 287 BRT study. Um, so Boulder County is obviously studying bus rapid transit on the 287 corridor. And so if, you know, using that project as an example, would that project be ineligible as a regional study application since it is just looking at a specific corridor, not the entire MPO boundary? And I guess wondering yeah, what, what kinds of studies Dr. Cog is envisioning and if corridor specific studies are excluded from the regional round based on this criteria. Yeah, so within the regional share, um, as you see on the screen, um, study limits must include the entire MPO boundary at a minimum. Um, so the, the concept here is since this is the regional share, um, uh, it would only make logical sense that any study would need to include the entire area, the entire regional boundary. So yes, based on what you had submitted last time along um, 287, that would not be eligible at this time as, as proposed. I, I guess I'm struggling a little bit with the logic of that, because if you apply that regioning to say a regional BRT or another corridor capital improvement, you know, using the study analogy, you'd have to say, well, you have to build a corridor that will stretch across the entire region because no single corridor is worthy of being regional. Whereas obviously for capital and safety projects, those are gonna be located on one specific corridor and they're not gonna benefit the entire region. So I guess I, I don't quite follow the logic to the study category. Ron, did you have a comment on that or clarification? I don't know if it's a clarification, but I, I will say I, I, the study language has always confused me. 
Um, and Alex, I think I think your example fits more under the corridor transit planning, multimodal capital, or potentially regional BRT projects, where that that the kind of study you're describing to me would be a pre-construction activity, right? So you're doing a you're doing a corridor study or an evaluation of a, a modal a modal evaluation on a particular corridor that would lead to a future capital project. I think that studies, as it, as the term is used in this table, and Todd, please correct me, um, or, or add additional detail. But I think studies in this case really relates more to sort of regional programmatic studies, um, something like. Oh, and an example of um, there's maybe an, an RTD region wide sort of um, analysis of a, a region like the regional BRT study that they that they completed a couple of years ago. Uh, anything else you can add to that to help clarify? You're you're muted, Todd. No, I, I think, Ron, you're 100% correct. I mean, the, the concept with the regional studies is whether it's something that may come from CDOT, from RTD, um, technically could come from Dr. Cog. Um, but the concept here is that since this is the regional share, it makes the most sense if we're going to make a study, include the entire MPO. And there is as Ron was getting into the individual project level, um, there is a difference between what might be a regional study and what you might look at as a study for a particular corridor as a precursor to an actual TIP funded project. Alex, Todd, Alex, I'm sorry, that... I'm sorry, Kent. No, so, go ahead. So Todd, the example that Alex gave would fit more under um, pre-construction activities under one of the other eligible categories. As, as, as you see the information proposed in the policy, correct. Does that help clarify for you, Alex? Uh, yeah, I think it clarifies. So I guess what my takeaway is that under the study category, it's pretty likely that only Dr. Cog, RTD, or CDOT would be applying for a study since a local jurisdiction would probably not conduct a region-wide study that would be by definition mostly outside of their jurisdiction. Yeah. But I, it would be done under the sub-regional area, right? Todd and Ron? I, I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had another suggestion on this table is, could you put that regional, put in the title regional uh, or region, regional, um, um, eligibility project so that if these two table, this table yep. and then your sub-regional table, uh, just to make it um, very clear, this is region, region wide only, not the sub-regions. Yes. Yep. Okay. Easy change. Okay. Then Brian, uh, Alex, did you have any other comments on before we move on? Uh, no more questions on this one, but I have a question on the next page, the PDF. Okay. On, on chapter five? Um, or, or chapter four yet? I think it's still on chapter four. Um, okay. My question was related to if whatever becomes of this federal infrastructure bill does indeed pass and we end up with significantly more money to allocate in the TIP than we're currently kind of anticipating, is, is there an opportunity to look at increasing the number of regional projects that each sub-regional forum is allowed to submit? Because I think currently we each get three projects I'm um, wondering if the amount of money turns out to be a whole lot more than we thought. Are we going to revisit that um, cap of three? I, yeah, I don't see why that could not be something to review once we actually have a signed bill and have a, a decent level of our known funding level. Okay, thank you. All right. Then Brian had a couple of uh, questions in the uh, chat. Um, can you please provide the variables that were used uh, for the funding targets for sub-regional compared to the current TIP? So I'm sorry, can you repeat that question again? 
Yeah, can you please provide the variables that were used for the funding targets for sub-regional compared to the current TIP? Okay. Um, so we're using the three factors. Um, continue with population, employment, and vehicle miles traveled. Uh, for population, that has been updated from 2016 to 2019. Um, same with employment and with the VMT, we are now using the 2020 base year from the 2020 model run of the current RTP. So two of your, what you're saying, Todd, is at least two of your factors changed there with the population in the VMT and probably some on employment too from the, from the current census. Well, yeah, I mean, all the numbers did adjust slightly, which does develop the funding target percentages that you see that you see in table four and then also on your screen okay does that clarify that for you brian you can answer in chat if you want to he says he'd like to see the data so on, okay. on that so on that piece of it um and then he also said, going back to chapter three, if additional funding came through a new bill, how will set aside funding to be handled? Are the set asides fixed or will they be adjusted? Traditionally, if new funding does come along in the middle of a cycle, um, the set asides are fixed and that additional money would not go towards the set aside, but would go towards the regional and sub-regional process i.e. The, the waiting list at that time. Ron, you had a comment on that? Yeah, just to, just, Todd's absolutely right. Just to add a little bit additional flavor, the set aside funding estimates that are currently, um, I, guess, I guess, proposed by staff at this point is uh, are based on the passage of the federal infrastructure bill. I think the real question is if the federal infrastructure bill ends up not passing, we likely we will go back and reevaluate those recommended funding uh, set aside funding uh, levels for the set aside programs at that point. So, it, I think Brian, to answer your question, the kind of the passage of the federal infrastructure bill is kind of assumed in the recommended funding levels for the set aside programs. And if that bill doesn't pass, we'll go back and sort of reevaluate. The appropriateness of um, these funding levels for the for the various set asides and have a have a different conversation then. Okay. That sounds good. Um, Todd, did you want to bring up that data slide now, or do you want to provide that later to the TAC? Um, yeah, actually, I think I think Josh has that slide, and I will stop sharing. And we'll let Josh bring that up. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Um, so this outlines the information that you previously saw on the screen that you see in the TIP policy. Um, it uh, includes the updated um, population, employment, and VMT. Um, I believe there was an earlier question um, outside of this meeting um, looking at whether to include VMT or to not include VMT. Um, so that happens to be the information in the bottom three lines. But the information that's contained um, that matches what's in the policy is the information you see there in lines 11 and 12, which has average of factors with VMT. Any questions from the group on this um, this distribution before we move off of it? If so, raise your hand. Elizabeth, go ahead. Hi, my question is related to the population calculation that was uh, calculated um, based on DOLA. I, I can't tell the percentage of unincorporated that was used. Was this just the municipalities populations that were added together or was there a percentage of unincorporated included? 
I might ask Josh to confirm just because he was looking at the data more than I was, but it should include the total population within the MPO area. That is correct. So um, both incorporated and unincorporated, but within the MPO section of the county. So you just in the model, you basically just drew the line and then um, in interpolated it. I can double check um, with our uh, um, with our team that put together the numbers to double check on the exact methodology, uh, but I believe that's correct. Um, Elizabeth, would you do you want them just to send you an email on on the verification of that? Yeah, that would be fine. Thanks. Okay, Todd, and Josh, can you do that? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, Brian also said thank you for the clarification earlier. So, um, and then Alex asked, um, or first of all, before we move off of this, is there any additional on this on this calculation or chart? Please raise your hand. Seeing none, we can go back to the to the to the policy. Um, Alex asked, um, what percentage of our assumed funding levels are the set-asides getting um, over the total? Is it similar to what it was before, or is it, yeah, I think it's a little higher from our previous discussions, if I recall right, but I'm not certain. <sighs> I don't recall off the top of my head. Ron, I don't know if you happen to remember. I don't, I, I don't know that I've that we've done a sp that specific calculation. I was just trying to pull up some information from the different options around um, integrating the multiple options fund. We one we don't have a final estimate of how much total resources would be available. Assuming the federal infrastructure bill passes, um, we kind of we kind of targeted a, an increase in the set aside amounts. Um, about the same increase that we expect to see in total funds available. And, you know, again, keep in mind that if the federal infrastructure bill passes and with um, Senate Bill 260 at the state level passing with, you know, a significant new uh, infusion of funds from the multiple options fund program at the state level and the federal investments through the, the federal in, uh, infrastructure bill, um, it's, a, it's a pretty pretty significant increase in total um, available resources for the next four-year tip versus the 20 to 23 tip cycle. But I, I'll, I'll keep working on trying to figure out at least a, a rough estimate on that if you want to keep taking other questions, Ken. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions on um, the introduction through chapter four? Please raise your hand or make a comment in the chat. Seeing none, let's move on to chapter five. Oh, Art, go ahead. Me? Oh, okay. Um, hey, Todd, real briefly, could you just explain where the additional money for the set-asides is coming from? I had some interested parties that wanted to know. Um, right, so, it, I mean, I don't have the table in front of me that has a a side by side comparison to the, the existing tip, um, but I will rely on as much memory as I can here. Um, so, TDM services uh, did happen to increase, and I want to say by roughly two million dollars, um, sort of evenly split over the three programs you're seeing on the screen. Obviously, the higher percentage. And dollar amount probably went to the way to go program. I believe their increase is approximately 800 to a million dollars. Um, the RTO and T program stayed the same. Um, air quality improvements um, did increase, but we have also shifted things because there is um, programs that are now being handled by the state instead of the RAC. Uh, for human service transportation, that amount has doubled from four million to eight million. Um, the new set aside community mobility planning and innovation. Um, again, we we took the um, the community mobility planning um, from 
the previous set aside, which we called CMPI. Um, and we've added other elements, um, but doing a side-by-side a -side comparison to the old CMPI to this now community mobility planning and innovation that has increased, but I don't know the dollar amount right off the top of my head. Just a follow-up question. Um, is there a pretty good distribution of those set asides throughout the subregion? Um, I think we would have to go back and look at that. Um, just over the last tip, just the, the dual model tip. Um, well, re remember that the set aside programs are not part of the dual model process. The set asides are all handled by calls for projects with the exception of the funding that goes to the RAC. And this money was handled, the set asides are handled in a more traditional way, how we used to do it before the regional and sub-regional call. So two things. Um, the first is, again, we'd have to check on the regional, uh, uh, an, an even distribution of projects, but most likely you probably won't find that because there are certain communities that, for example, will not apply for a lower federal amount to federalize projects, or they simply may not wish to fund that type of individual project out of, out of that set aside fund. So there may be reasons why there is not a, a distribution that seems like it's based in equity. Um, there are, as part of these set asides, there's also regional programs. So we would have to go back through and literally take out what we are looking at a regional project, maybe say it was submitted by RTD or it was submitted by CDOT. Um, so there's different ways to look at this. So it would be hard pressed to say, going back within the last tip cycle, there may or may not be an equal distribution of projects because there it was the, the set asides were handled in a different way in terms of the call for projects than the regional and sub-regional share. But we certainly can provide that data if that is something that you're looking for. Thanks for that dialogue. The dialogue was helpful, thanks. Mr. Chair. You're muted. Thank you. I'm muted. Art, did you need them to provide that information? I don't think so at this time. I think right. Todd gave me some good explanation of how complicated it is, you know, and trying to track that down. So I, I don't think so at this time. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Ron, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll thank Mr. Griffith for the question because they gave me some time to do some, some math. Um, so I think at this point, our, our rough estimate of the total available resources we'll have for this next cycle, if the federal infrastructure bill passes um, and accounting for what we think we will receive of the local share of the multiple options fund, the state multiple options fund money through Senate Bill 260 would be in the neighborhood of about $650 million uh, for this next cycle. Todd, do you recall about how much we had available for the 20 to 23 cycle? I think about $350 million sticks in my head, but can you confirm? I will have to look back, but 280 sort of sticks in my head. Um, so yeah, uh, so anyways, a significant increase in funding, right? Um, the total of the current, uh, the current proposal for the set aside programs in total is, a, is just over $63 million. So less than 10% of the total estimated resources we would have for this next tip cycle. That's, um, that would be a reduction in terms of a, of a percentage. The last tip cycle, 20 to 23, it was just shy of $50 million in set aside programs, I believe 49.5 or $49.9 million across all the set aside programs. Uh, so that would have been a higher percentage of say $300 million. You're still muted, Kent. Thank you, Ron. Um, 
this the central 70 was also included in the set of sites wasn't it on a because it was taken off the top right correct no, the, what was it a, was it a set aside todd i thought it was an off the top off the regional share correct it, it was a it was an off the top of the regional share oh, okay correct okay that's right all right thank you for the clarification all right any additional questions on uh, chapters uh, chapter five or, or before? Please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any or any comments. Anything mm -hmm. on Appendix A? Again, I do not see any comments or there are of uh, hands raised. Any general, other general comments about the, the tip? You know, we have, I guess, Appendix B through D and the regional share application has yet to be developed. Bill, go ahead, Saroy. Sorry, getting my stuff unmuted. So we we have some changes to our process because of the recent adoption of our strategic plan for um, the our mid range or midterm financial plan process. So, Todd, what when do you need um, to get those changes? Because it's this is like brand new to us. So I, I need to kind of get with some people and huddle, make sure I've got the right information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you would like to make any edits to Appendix A or any place else where RTD is involved. Uh, if you could let us know by, let's say December 1st. Okay. I think that would be appropriate. That'll give us enough time to make sure that we have the correct information into the draft document that TAC will see later that month. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Um, any other additional comments on, on this document for Todd? Alex? Um, yeah, I had a question on page 52 of our agenda packet. Um, I think, and maybe I'm, uh, oh yeah, it was 52 of the agenda packet, not the policy document. I apologize, gotcha. I don't know what page. Um, it's the, uh, eligible projects um, in the 2050 MetroVision RTP table in Appendix C. Okay. Um, I think that uh, US 36, 28th Street and State Highway 93 Broadway um, corridor safety improvements are listed under all phases eligible and pre-construction only phase eligible. Um, and I I'm assuming it's a mistake that it's listed in both, and I was just wanting to clarify which one is correct. Do you know where, what category is that under again? I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's this one. I think you just need to scroll down a little more. Uh, we'll scroll, scroll up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, CIC Boulder US 36 28th Street is listed under that top section and then it looks like the same project is also listed under the pre-construction activities only the second okay. in that category and I'm assuming it's a mistake that's listed in both it is certainly possible that it's a mistake um, Josh and I took this information from um, directly from the RTP but we obviously did organize it so we will we will go back and check the RTP and make the correction that's necessary. And uh, maybe certainly we'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex. Do you have any other questions on that, Alex? Uh, I had a question for Appendix D, but nothing else on C. Okay, go ahead and ask it. Um, so just the the application, um, it says that the application is to be, a to be placed in Appendix D once the policy is approved. Um, so after the policy is approved, does the application document itself come through TAC and the RTC and the board, or how does that process work to get from where we are now to an application document that has the different weights of the different sections that we're all going to be applying to? Mm -hmm. So 
sort of the plan as we go out um, at your next meeting, November 15th. Um, of course, we will bring back the, the tip policy. So if there's any questions that need to be asked at that time, we can continue with that. Uh, we also plan on bringing some form of a draft application, um, whether it is the actual application or at least one of the two applications or a high level overview of one or both. So there will be something to react to. Uh, we haven't worked through all everything internal yet. So it is quite possible. Uh, we will um, put in some draft weights and ask TAC to have a comment on that. Um, but the plan is, and Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the policy will be part of the actual TIP policy. You mean the application will be part the, of the policy? I'm sorry, the application, yes, will be part of the TIP policy itself. Okay. So we, and just to make sure I heard correctly, that is going to come back in, or that's the application is going to start coming to us in some shape or form at our next TAC meeting. And so it will come through the TAC and RTC and board. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Any other questions, Alex? Um, on? Yeah, one last question. Um, at some of our previous TAC meetings, we've been discussing um, a minimum federal request for the regional share. Uh, which I think was originally proposed by Dr. Cog's staff at 5 million. And then we did some polling that seemed to suggest um, the TAC would be supportive of a two to $3 million minimum federal request. But I think what I saw in this TIP policy was just the $100,000 minimum request and then the $20 million maximum federal request. Um, so I'm wondering what happened to that discussion on the different minimum federal requests for the regional share, or maybe I listed in the document. Nope, uh, I think sort of just based on some internal discussions that we had, and I'm, I'm trying to even find the section here, but I don't know if I see it. Um, it, it was decided to not, not include a minimum within, um, a minimum within the regional share that's different than the sub-regional share. Todd, Todd, this is Ron, sorry, that, that, was, that was also the, re the result of feedback that we received from the board when we talked to that issue about the board after TAC. Okay, so the, the minimum for both will stand at 100,000 then? Correct. I think that answered all my questions, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, Brian had a question. Um, is CDOT relooking at their 10 year plan and, and uh, what is the revision process um, if they're not done by the time we adopt the TIP? I, I, I added the last portion of that. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice hybrid question, Mr. Chair. I, I think that falls under chair's prerogative. Um, so uh, Brian and Brian and Kent, uh, yes, CDOT, CDOT has informed um, all of its partners um, through Stack and otherwise that um, they will be uh, reviewing and, and uh, updating its 10-year plan. Uh, keep and remember that under Senate Bill 260, which passed the legislature this year, um, CDOT is required to review and update its 10-year plan by October 1st of next year. North Front Range MPO and Dr. Cog are also required to review and update their regional transportation plans uh, by October 1st of next year as well. Um, uh, and that's all in the context of the um, greenhouse gas rulemaking and the greenhouse gas uh, provisions in uh, Senate Bill 260. So that, that is all happening. Uh, we're, we as staff at Dr. Cog are coordinating with CDOT about sort of the process for aligning those, all of the, those efforts for the RTP and the 10-year list uh, and, and how we sort of work through that process. But if you recall from the last TAC discussion, one of the reasons that staff is recommending sort of that sequential process for the next TIP cycle so that we sort of carve out the multimodal options fund and the CMAC funds um, uh, in an earlier step is so that we can focus on those projects um, while the RTP and the tenure list are sort of being updated and reviewed so that we have that in place prior to moving forward um, after that with the with the SDPG funds, which are, are more flexible. Art, or, or before we go to Art, uh, Brian, did that answer your question or clarify? 
And I didn't know if anyone from CDOT would like to speak to yeah. what their process is going to be. Um, no, I think I saw Danny on. I don't know if Danny'd like to speak to that. Hey, uh, Ken, this is Paul. Um, okay, go ahead, Paul. I, th I, think, I think Ron uh, gave as much information as we have right now. So we're working on that process and trying to figure out exactly what that will look like. So it'll take a little bit longer. Um, we've got to, you know, we'll be looking at the greenhouse gas rules and how that affects what that 10-year list looks like. Um, but at this point, we don't really have a process on exactly what that is going to look like. So probably next few months, we'll have that. Okay, I see thanks. Marissa too. Marissa, you want to add to that or I get it about right? I need to unmuting, but I think you got it. Everything that I was going to mention, Paul. So thank you for, for chiming in. Thank you guys for the your update on that. Art, you had a question? Oh, sorry, or, Ken. Um, just, to, just, to, oh, just to close on that conversation. Yeah, please uh, do. To be assured that TAC will be engaged in, in that in that process. We'll be as as we work with CDOT to sort of nail down what that what that process looks like. We'll we'll you will definitely see it around around this, well, almost said around this table, um, around these screens. <laughs> okay. As, as that as, as both of those processes move forward. All right. Thank you. Art, go ahead. Yeah, real quick, um, maybe a follow-up. Um, for Paul or others at CDOT. Um, I know that uh, you, know, you gotta develop that 10 year plan, but it seems like listening in at the stack and other meetings, the big focus is always on the four year pipeline as opposed to the 10 year pipeline. And I'm wondering, will that four year pipeline uh, coincide nicely with our um, tip cycle so that we can memorialize partnering opportunities with CDOT. So that's probably a loaded question, but I want to throw it out there. Our, uh, so this, Paul, I don't know exactly how that's going to align. I'll accept your comment as a good one. It's always nice when we can align the two processes. I don't have a timeline yet at this point, but it's a, it's a good thought. We've done that in the past and we've matched and worked together on those projects. So, uh, so good point. Thank you, Art. Does that answer the rest of your questions there? Yes, thanks. I had to unmute first, bye. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. All right, are there any other uh, general comments or questions on, on the, um, draft tip policy that we see before us today. Just want to thank uh, Todd and Ron and your whole crew for uh, taking the first shot at this. And uh, I know it's, a, it's a, a work in progress. So we look forward to seeing some of the revisions that we discussed today. But overall, I thought the document summarized well what we've been talking about over the last few months. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, with that, then we will, uh, I see no more comments on it or no more hands raised. Let's uh, move on to our next uh, item, uh, which is member comments and uh, uh, other matters. And first, if we could have a briefing from uh, Carson on the uh, AMP working group. Thanks, Mr. Appreciate. Chair. Uh, I actually don't have an update since we had such a short uh, period between meetings this last time you guys are caught up. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is our second meeting in October for, uh, uh, this this time. So this haven't had too many two meetings in the same month this year. So we've appreciated that staff. Um, the uh, uh, any other member comments or other matters? Um, please uh, raise your hand or make a comment in the chat. Jacob, I'll let you have a minute. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I didn't want to cut off any other sort of member comments, but just on that note of having two meetings in one month, as TAC will recall, uh, we met on October 5th to accommodate the public comment review period schedule for the Complete Streets Toolkit. Um, again, I really appreciate that. And I thought on that note, I should let TAC know that um, we brought the Complete Streets Toolkit both to our regional transportation committee and to our board um, this month. In fact, our board meeting last week and the board adopted it unanimously. 
Um, so I want to take that opportunity just one last time to thank TAC, not only for accommodating the meeting schedule, but um, you know, for TAC's work and the local governments and all the stakeholders work on the Complete Streets document itself. So thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Any other comments or uh, please raise your hand. I see none. Our next meeting will be uh, November 15th. Um, and uh, with that, at uh, 225, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ken.